This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision-making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm Brandon Pollan, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, F. Scott Veal. And today, we are truly humbled to have a very compassionate physical therapy educator on the show today. Today, we welcome Dr. Amy York for a discussion into leadership development within education. Now, I had first heard about Amy through Alan Frenenal when we were in the early planning stages of this podcast. And, and for those who don't know who Alan is, he is the Chief Operating Officer within the Institute of Clinical Excellence. Amy is an ABPTS Board Certified Neurologic Clinical Specialist and an APTA Advanced Credentialed Clinical Instructor. She has co-developed a continuing education course on vestibular rehab and has provided post-professional education on a national basis. Her professional affiliations include the American Physical Therapy Association and Michigan Physical Therapy Association. Amy's teaching areas include evaluation and treatment of patients with neurological disabilities. Her research interests include topics regarding teaching and learning in graduate education, interprofessional education, and measures of physical performance. She is currently an assistant professor and now soon to be associate professor as of September 1st at the University of Michigan Flint DPT program. Now, thanks so much, Amy, for all of your help with the podcast, your service to the PT profession, and for coming on the show today. And now I realize that there was a lot that I didn't mention about what you've done throughout your career as I kept your bio brief, but was there anything that you'd like our listeners to know about you that I didn't mention in the intro? Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, Just to give people a little idea, I have worked in uh, acute care, outpatient home care, and now I find myself in the academic setting. And I've been there for the last um, nine years. And I still do a little bit of clinical practice on the side. Um, Really, almost all of my experience has been working with patients who have neurological diseases and disorders. And I have held leadership positions, formal leadership positions in both the acute care and the home care settings. And I think just um, personally, I've actually been married um, almost 24 years to my um, high school sweetheart, and we have two boys who are 13 and 15 years old. So I feel like I have a very full life, both uh, professionally and personally. Awesome. Awesome, Amy. Um, You know, we brought you on the show today to discuss leadership because, you know, we felt that leadership is a very essential quality to have. And there's so many different definitions and views on this topic. But what do you think about when you hear someone say leadership? When I hear the word leadership, I envision people that I have known in my life who have demonstrated certain characteristics. So I think of certain family members, I think of teachers. So I think of someone who is passionate, someone who has a lot of drive, but yet is humble, someone who has a vision and a person who inspires me to be the best that I can be. And all in all, this is a person who has very strong communication skills, both verbally and non-verbally, right? That's how they engage me. That's how I know that they're passionate and how I know that they're driven and that they share their vision. And I, I believe that commonly when people think about leadership, they think of it as a position versus a characteristic. And for me, leadership is just more about skills. And it, and it is different than management. It's much more than being able to, you know, organize a staff uh, schedule. It's it's much more than that. It's this bigger picture. Yeah, Amy, to that point, I, I, I feel like, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in my 10 years of, of practice is, you know, leaders are not actually out in front leading. They're, they're creating more leaders to come with them. You know, it seems like um, it's not, you know, you're not the one person leading the charge. You're literally making people better at what they do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that really, that type of thinking really goes with this idea of like transformational leadership, right? That the two of us together are able to do 
bigger and better things than if each of us did it by our own. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and that really goes to how students can view themselves as leaders that in a position where they don't really have a lot of power, yet they, they can really have the opportunity to really demonstrate, demonstrate leadership. Absolutely. We just had uh, a couple of people on the podcast not too long ago that were uh, DPT students who were doing their own podcasts and who were really leading the charge, you know, for their upcoming generation of physical therapists. And, I, you know, I cannot commend them enough because it's just I didn't have that kind of drive when I was a student. I was just trying to survive, you know. So to see these young students doing as much as they are at this level in the game is amazing. And it's 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 a good testament to what's to come, I think. Yeah, for sure. And with those guys too, it's amazing, you know, of how really what they're trying to do, they're not trying to work for themselves. They're trying to really work for others and for the profession and just having that selfless component of it to really transform and change others in that regard and make a difference is truly, at least in my opinion, that's a true definition of at least part of my definition of a leader as well. So I think that was a good point, Scott. You know, Amy, with your experience in the realm of education and kind of looking at it from a 30,000 foot view, Do you think you could give our listeners an overview into how leadership development currently is in higher education and specifically healthcare higher education? When I think about leadership development in higher education, it's really provided in numerous methods. And so opportunities would exist both within and outside of your academic institution, as well as within and outside of your professional organization. So for example, within the physical therapy profession, the American Physical Therapy Education and Leadership Institute, so they call it ELI, Education Leadership Institute Fellowship, is really this shared collaborative between the American Council of Academic Physical Therapy, the education Education section, the PTA educator special interest groups, and the APTA. And Eli is this um, program. It's a year long blended program, both online and on site, that's really intended to develop the leaders in physical therapy education who can function in this changing environment. And it's intended for new or want to be physical therapist and physical therapist assistant program directors. So that's one thing within our profession. Um, You know, the education section also provides a new faculty development workshop that really helps new faculty understand their roles and responsibilities and why that doesn't, doesn't necessarily direct leadership. I think it does really help faculty, particularly physical therapy faculty who weren't trained to be faculty. We were trained to be physical therapists. So that transition from the clinic to the classroom and really kind of understanding and feeling more confident about what your roles are and and I think for me, when I think about leadership development, the more that you know about yourself, the 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 better leader that that you will be. So, yeah, those are a couple examples within our organizations outside of our uh, professional organizations. I look, I would always tell people to look for opportunities that are named fellowships. So. For example, I recently attended something called Train the Trainer, and it was an interprofessional faculty development program. And the intention of this program is to prepare faculty who teach in health professions um, to lead um, IPE efforts and really promote interprofessional team-based care. So it's this idea that they're developing leaders who can lead IPE across kind of the learning continuum, not only in classroom, but also in clinical and community sites. Wow, Amy, I'm I'm so glad we had you on because I I didn't even know about these things. And these are actually legitimate things that I I would seriously be interested in because, you know, Brandon, when he reached out to me for this podcast, I think a a good portion, and we've mentioned it before, but a good portion of the reason we did this is to to learn – about what direction we want to head in educationally. You know, I'm working on my educational doctorate and I'm working on my dissertation and I don't even know where I want to go with that and what direction I want to head. So like to have these opportunities and and, and possibly do some sort of leadership training or, or mentorship or, or fellowship is, uh, I mean, it's a sounds like just absolutely amazing opportunities. So, so that's, I'm really glad those things are even out there because like I said, that's something I, I didn't even know about. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I'm going to have one more follow-up question kind of to that. I know you're kind of talking about um, leadership development within higher education, but I'm kind of curious from your perspective as an educator, what are your thoughts on within leadership development in DPT programs? Yeah. So when you think about leadership development and physical therapy programs, right, traditionally students that enter a PT program are extremely driven, high performing students. And within the program, there's always opportunities for leadership. So maybe to serve as a um, class officer, 
to maybe serve as the DPT, like student association or club, to get involved in association, local, state association, student groups. So you've got those things, but I'm not necessarily convinced that as a program or programs or physical therapy education, that we do a great job in really considering, should we be developing leaders? And should we consider developing leaders and knowing that if I develop leaders, I'll automatically get professionalism. But just because I try to promote professionalism doesn't mean that I will develop leaders. So kind of chicken egg, egg chicken thing. When I think about even our vision statement and how it starts with the word transform, if we really want to transform society by optimizing movement, we really should look to thread leadership development throughout the entire program. Because in order to meet that vision, we're going to need transformational leaders and we're going to need to really change what is happening. Yeah, for sure. It's like not even, not just focusing on professional, but personal development as well, because professional knowledge, I mean, that's not necessarily going to carry over to our patients. Like if I know all the skills in the world, it doesn't matter if that patient doesn't respect who I am as a person. Absolutely. And without intentionally kind of planting the seed and or continuing to fertilize something that's already grown inside of a student, we're we're going to we're going to fail. We're going to stop short of our vision statement. And and to me leadership development is something that happens over a lifetime, right? It's not something that just happens in one class. It's at different points in your life, you're going to have the opportunity to develop your leadership skills and how can we best leverage the skills and the knowledge and the attitudes that our students come in with and really facilitate that growth. So when they come out, they really are prepared to continue to grow. Right. No, I think that's great. And, you know, with that being said, you know, of course, you know, there's the, the discussion comes up of how do we do this? And, to answer that, you know, first, I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers currently limiting leadership development in higher education? Current structure, this is this is my opinion, doesn't seem to always value leadership development. And traditional attitudes within the academic setting seem to respect people more for the degree that they have as necessarily compared to the results that they generate. When you think about leadership in academia, and this happens in the clinic too, you know, the longer that you're there, it's just kind of anticipated or expected that you would then kind of move up the ladder. So, right, I'm going from assistant to associate professor. My goal is to go to associate to full. Well, after full, like what's left? What's next? And many faculty find themselves then stepping into a leadership position, whether that be a director of the program or a dean. And I think that's completely appropriate if that's what you want to do. But sometimes it seems that people are just kind of pushed into those positions because that becomes the what next. I think time is a barrier. Uh, People who enter the academy are on, who are on a tenure track need to be focused in gaining tenure if that's their professional and personal goal. So that means they need to be successful in the classroom and they need to be successful publishing and providing service in that. There's only so many hours in a day. So if leadership development's not going to get me tenure, then why would I invest time and energy to that? Also, a lack of available funds could be perceived as a barrier, but I'm not convinced that you need a lot of money to really develop leaders within an institution. I think really smart um, mentoring programs that don't cost a lot of money, uh, really identifying those leaders within the institution who want to help, I think can really go a long way into really help, helping your institution grow. Yeah, good point, Amy. And I, I'd like to paint a picture here, okay? I, I'm a new professor stepping into a, a, a new program, right? And what are some things that I could do to maybe overcome some of these barriers and plant those seeds for leadership in my students that you were kind of talking about? So for for me, for planting those seeds, the things that I look at about a leader are the things that I portray to my students. So I am pretty passionate about neurologic physical therapy and I get pretty excited about it. And my students can figure that out probably within the first, probably within the first minute that they ever meet me or are in my class. 
I also share a vision with them. Um, in my syllabus, I explicitly state, this is what I want you to look like at the end of the semester. I anticipate that you would be able to evaluate somebody and do an intervention with them that's based in evidence where you really take into context what the patient needs, really supporting patient autonomy. So I share that vision with them. I try to model behaviors. I, I try to model humility. I don't always have the right answers. I, I don't. And I'm, I'm okay saying that question that I thought that was the right answer. I understand what you're telling me and I'm going to accept this answer and that answer. So this, this like acknowledgement, right, that I'm not always right and I don't always have the answers. And with that, I goes providing a safe environment that I want you to try and you've got to be willing to take risk. Taking risk is what you want to do in your practice. You just have to be careful about it and be smart about it and be ready to evaluate and understand the consequences and being able to change and to to change course when things aren't going well. So for the students, like when thinking about how do I try to plant those seeds, I think being the leader that I kind of attach to is something that um, I really, really appreciate. Cool. So kind of st- still being in that role, and now that we're kind of looking at it, you know, in terms of with, from the professor to the student, but, you know, what if I'm in that new professor role and I want to change it more in terms of other faculty and staff or how the university is overall, the program's overall doing it? What, what are some strategies or some things that you could, you think would be effective to help to help plant the seeds and facilitate it in that regard? So when it comes to planting like seeds and the faculty and really trying to facilitate growth, I would tell faculty to engage in the activities that you're passionate about and to be open to opportunities that present themselves. One of the best things about working at an academic institution is there are some extremely intelligent, engaging people that you can come across every day from all over your campus. So within the first month that I started teaching, I actually had the director from our teaching and learning center um, complete a formative assessment of my teaching, which meant she came to my class, she took copious notes, and we had a discussion about it. And it wasn't meant to be anything punitive. It was just meant to really help form me, help to, to help me as a teacher. And from that point in time, I developed a very strong relationship with her, but also with the Teaching and Learning Center. And this relationship over time, over this last nine years, got me a position on their board for a couple of years. I've been able to present numerous times at our institution. And so my relationship with the with our teaching and learning center has really set me up to be kind of a leader as a teacher in our organization. So I get asked to do things for the center and and I do it because I enjoy it and I I love teaching and I I love listening to other people talk about their teaching as well. So I you know really think about what are you passionate about? So know yourself well. Really know your strengths. Uh, know your tendencies and and be able to recognize strengths in others. Um, I'm a doer. I don't like to talk. And that's probably the one thing that aggravates me the most about being in an academic setting because there's a lot of people who need to talk a lot. And so being recognizing that about myself, that I like to just do it and I'll figure it out as I go along or if it, if I screw it up, that's okay, right? Um, whereas other people really need to think about it. And I've got to be thankful for those people because they, they will point out something that I'll forget and our final project will be better. So I think having patience with others, um, knowing that because I know myself really well and then I know the other value that people bring, I, I think is also important. Yeah, no, for sure. That's a good take. And, you know, kind of switching it over to the different role here. What are some steps that students should be taking to encourage leadership? And I think that they should know themselves. And so saying that the majority of our students are in their early to mid 20s when they enter um, the DPT program. And there's some students that aren't. But the more that you that you know yourself and you know what you like and even what you don't like or what makes you uncomfortable or what interests you, I think that also being willing to invest in yourself. So that means volunteer, go talk to faculty, go to events like within and outside of the department and be engaged 
Those are all things that are so important. And I was one of those students who um, was ex- was extremely young when I got accepted to the program, and I was very focused. Right, the only thing I knew was study hard and study a lot. And so, you know, when I entered the program, that's what I continued. That's what I continued to do, and and I was successful with that. However, I was less likely to volunteer for a student position within our state organization. Um, And I was less likely to serve as a graduate student research assistant with a faculty, right? Because I had my own self-doubts that there's no way that anybody would want to hire me. Why would they want me? You know, Amy York, um, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. And we are our own worst critics. And so when students make an effort to come talk to me, and this recently happened, I got an email from an undergraduate student who'd got my name from a student who's entering our program. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk with you. And, you know, I just want to know a little bit more about you and, you know, what characteristics you have, you know, that would make you somebody that I would want to see. Yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to work with me on this project. And um, we had a great conversation and I ended up hiring him. And I, and I just thought that that was just fantastic that he did that. And I, I do think that there's gender differences. So for me being a female, I think I'm very, very sensitive to the commonly males will be more likely to, to be that assertive. And I recognize it's a bias of mine. So I'll just, I'll just say that females don't always do that. And, and I want to be supportive of both males and females to recognize that they can do it. You can do it. You got to try. You have to be able to say, you know what? I'm okay being uncomfortable. Right. Wow. It, yeah. That is great advice. It's the old got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Sure. Especially in the field of physical therapy, right? Absolutely, man. So Amy, uh, do you know, are there any unique leadership development models or framework perhaps done by other universities or programs that you're aware of, uh, like in the higher learning environments throughout the U.S.? I know Duke has a a new professor mentorship program, but um, that's about the only one that I've heard of. Do you know if, if there's any others out there? Yeah, I, within our institution, we do have like a, a new faculty mentoring program as well. So I do think within faculty development, that's a common thing that you'll see. There is on a national basis, there's the American Council on Education. They actually have a leadership program that really helps higher education future leaders. So again, like dean provost level to really kind of be able to deal with the real world challenges. It's a it's a program that's been around for a very long time and actually has been studied um, longitudinally. So I know on a national level, the American Council on Education actually has a leadership program. Wow, that was really good. I never I had no idea that that even existed. But that's definitely something I'll have to check out. And hopefully some of our listeners will as well. (laughs) You know, you kind of briefly talked on this before, Amy, in terms of um, leadership qualities um, for candidacy and a graduate stool and with that. But I'm curious, what are your thoughts on leadership, leadership requirements for candidacy in a university undergraduate student? Yeah, so one of our challenges, I think, with requiring like leadership is, again, this idea that I can show evidence of leadership if I served as the pre-PT club president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. But did that really mean that you were a leader, right? Did that really say that you had a vision and you you made people, you know, want to, you had people who really wanted to work with you and you were able to transform something? So I think that's one of our current challenges when we think about admissions is really kind of teasing out What are characteristics of a leader that we we could potentially ask our applicants about, whether it be through an essay or through face-to-face interviews? Because students won't always recognize that they were leaders as well. Students may think, well, I didn't serve in a leadership role or position, therefore I've never been a leader. When in fact, maybe they're um, the firstborn of their family and they are the ones who always organize every family get together or, you know, so I do think that this idea of leadership or how do we measure it or how, again, can we grow it? I think it is important to us as a profession. Yeah. And You know, Amy, I think uh, really it it goes back to that definition of leadership we were kind of talking about at the beginning of the show. Like, 
you know, just putting down on a piece of paper that you held a position doesn't really necessarily show that leadership, you know, it's, it's, it's more than that. And I think that you can kind of get a sense of it a lot of times when you're doing those like in-person interviews, you know, is this someone who, who can take charge and who can make a difference and a change amongst a group? Or, you know, is it someone who just held the secretary position, you know, or, or something like that. So I, I definitely think there's a, there's just a certain feeling or, or a sense amongst leaders. Like you can just kind of grasp it, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I think too, I really try, I'm really sensitive to those that are more introverted that could still be a leader, but they just don't, be Absolutely. The, they, they're not the loudest speakers. And how could we really try to ensure that we, that we don't exclude somebody who tends just to be more introverted? How do we draw that out of somebody? And I do think it's commonly with conversation that unfortunately you don't necessarily get during interview process. But if you spend enough time with me in my office, I'm going to have a sense within the first couple minutes. But the more time I spend with you, the more I'm going to learn about you and the more that I could help feed that and or help that person see it. Because commonly when somebody is younger, they don't necessarily see it yet either. Yeah, definitely. Self, self-reflection. Uh, self finding, if you will, you know, like that journey into the self and really figuring out who you are. I mean, I'm, I'm what 38 now and I'm still figuring it out. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely understand it takes some time to, to really find that, you know, and, and find the answer. Amy, we like to wrap up each episode with this question that we ask all of our guests. Um, but if you could change one aspect of higher education, DPT or other healthcare related, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? I would say spend less time in the classroom and more time out in the community. So when I went to school, I graduated in 1993, well before the internet. So right, if I wanted to get the information, I had to come to class and buy the book, right? Like that was how I got information. And we're living in this world of so much information. So I feel like students now need teachers to guide and facilitate their knowledge And I think what a better way to do that than to practice and work with people who actually have movement dysfunction. So like get out of the classroom and actually like work with people. Because when you do, when you have a person in front of you, everything comes together. And I really think that that helps drives this idea of really deep learning. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. My dissertation is actually on service-based learning and trying to figure out how we can get that more into the... uh, the hands of, of just about every professor in the PT world, because I, I feel like it's just such a great tool and we're just not using it enough. So, you know, that hands-on is really absolutely a great tool. The more we can get them hands-on experience, the better off we are, I think, as, as students and as educators. So definitely a good point. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, not only even that, but helping out the community with the chronic health diseases and the problems as well especially with lack of access to care so i think we're kind of knocking a couple things out with that one absolutely absolutely idea well you know amy thank you so much for your time and insight and you know for our listeners who want to follow up where can people find you online and on social media um they could always email me so my email is a m york y-o-r-k-e at um flint f-l-i-n-t dot e-d-u and I do have a Twitter account, and so that's at A M York Y O R K E, and then Neuro P T N E U R O P T. And then I also just want to do a shout out. I've recently started a blog um, with a student, a student who um, is getting ready to graduate, and so our blog is called Sammy. So it's S A M Y, and then hyphen P T dot com. Awesome. We'll have to check that out. And I hope all of our listeners will go out and check that out as well. Amy, thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure tonight to have you on. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.